This episode was brought to you by CambodiaSoulmate.com because sometimes you need to travel the world to find your soulmate. On the Indian coast was fantastic. I squeezed in beside a gaily dressed Indian woman at the window. I preferred not to think how I squeezed in beside an Indian dress, uh, gaily dressed woman who was dabbing nervously at her throat with a lace handkerchief. She cut her eyes towards me and then favored me with a smile. I smiled back. And she turned to look at the rapidly receding ground, allowing me to see the wonders spreading throughout her face. The airship bucked in a straight air current and threw the woman into my arms. I set her on my feet. Uh, I apologized in my embrace. Or I tightened my embrace. I apologized as though British. I set her on her feet. And she gave me a grateful look, though it was edged with fear. Thank you, sir, she said quickly, and bolted from the observation deck without a backward look. Strange. She just picked my pocket. She better not. Fog. Fog. Oh, oh, it didn't let me. I saw the Indian woman from the previous day beside a tightly corseted English memsabi. Uh, I may glanced in her direction, and she blanched. She made her excuses to her mistress and left the observation. I was, I reflected, losing my charm. The mensabi, uh, mensahib marched over. Do you know uh, Aleya? She, man she demanded. Uh, she fell yesterday, and I caught her. I meant no harm, but she seemed frightened. Liar, the lady hissed. You do know her. What have you done, you brute? I merely caught her when she fell. Yesterday, as we were taking off. The Mem Sahib seemed satisfied with my answer, for she drew back. Alea has had a difficult life, she said softly. I am protective of her. It is rare to see such friendship. The woman seemed to soften. There are not many among us who would believe friendship possible between two such women, but they are wrong. I saw Aliyah and the Mensahib only once more as we are disemb uh, dis disembarking the um, Atmatic. Blech. I gave Aliyah a bow, the Mensahib a nod, in which she returned with well-bred distant courtesy. I turned to look at the city up the coastline. Thick with oil smoke and glinting with metal, we had reached Bombay, a jewel in the crown of the British Empire. <laughs> yep, okay, so we're gonna sell this bad boy. Alright, uh, tea set, could be valuable in Agra, Congo, okay. Lock of Henna in Rangoon. Are we going to Rangoon? That's the question. Uh, Rangoon, as I recall, is, yeah, right there. That's Chittagong. That's Calcutta. So we're probably going to be going... Jeez. Uh, okay. It's March tomorrow, so... It's partying tomorrow anyway. Let's go ahead and explore. Nova Goa, Alibab, oh, to Galcutta, aha. Monsieur Fogg cared not a straw for the wonders of Bombay, but gave me a few hours leisure as he settled to his luncheon. I ended up wheezing and puffing my way up Malabar Hill, the highest point in South Bombay. I paused at the top to look towards the city and looked out at the bay. To look out at the bay. British airships dominated the skyline, tethered loosely to the gunboats that patrolled the docks. Brightly painted merchant ships darted into the harbor, eager to unload their cargo before the light faded. Catching my breath, I found my steps irresistibly drawn towards the Hanging Gardens, which shielded the Parsi Tower of Silence from the bay. Uh, the Hanging Gardens was magnificent. The little steam-powered curricles and horse-drawn carriages uh, vied for space beneath, uh, underneath the shady trees. British officers escorted their stiff, bodiced wives or made eyes at brightly dressed Indian girls. 
And in the shadow of the gardens, I saw the, the symbol of the copper lily on the door of a converted mansion. That's the artificers. I approached and knocked on the door, and was given a cup of tea and a cushioned wicker chair almost as soon as I crossed the threshold of this outpost of the artificers' guild. The setting was opulent. A, an open plaza lit from the skylights above, lined with palm trees, is palm large urns. Okay, uh, <clears throat> a fountain in the middle of the room had been converted to pump steam, which drove the pistons of a gilt-edged sus suspended organ, which clattered out a lively tune. A middle-aged Sikh in a bright blue turban and admirably pressed trousers approached me. What is it you require, traveler? Uh, I am interested in transportation. I want to know the fastest way from here. Um, we're not doing awful for time. My master and I are going around the world. I see. Well then, welcome to Bombay. Um, I am interested in transportation. What inventions have you made? The artificers bickered amongst each other in at least six different languages before Dar Dar Dharampal, the Sikh, smiled. We have invented many small things that are useful but not important, like caps that prevent water from falling from bottles when tipped suddenly upside down. But in transportation, we have nothing. <laughs> there are no rocket ships? No motorized snakes? Nothing? So the fastest route from here is the train? Perhaps, though myself, I would head south to Colombo, where there are airships. Ah. I'll look where Colombo is. I thanked the artificers profusely, profusely before taking my leave, though, alas, I was so distracted by my musings that I failed to notice two thuggish fellows... Shoot. Uh, with ill intent, who cornered me in the side street and demanded my shoes. These are fine Italian leather. A man's shoes are his castle. I handed them over. A man's shoes are his castle, I contended, which had the laudable effect of confusing them for a few moments while I attempted a discreet but ultimately fruitless escape. I returned to my master barefoot and rather shamefaced. I hope that this will not happen again, my master said my master coldly. That was to be my, the last word on Bombay, gateway to the jewel and the crown of the British Empire. Except for, and what, pray, has happened to your shoes? All right. Do I want to go by Calcutta? Let's, let's stay the night. We have to anyway. As night fell, I attended... To, yeah, I'm going to attend to him because he's... Boy, this guy, he is not appreciating this... Uh, this All this travel. All right, I'm going to let time pass a little bit um, and, and check the market because it does look like we're doing Calcutta and Rangoon if we can. So let's... It was... Colombo, that's Rangoon. Oh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait a minute! 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 Wait! Colombo. Oh, maybe not, because they said airships in Colombo, and they said that was the fastest. Embark. Let's go. We're not desperate for money, and um, if we can take an airship, airships are definitely fast. The Bombay Express was a fine train, luxurious and opulent. Inside each softly lit compartment, Persian rugs and Venetian lamps threw color over fittings of teakwood and bur burnished brass. Most acceptable. If only all of our journeys were so well appointed. Uh, converse. Greetings. Can I help you? Have you locked yourself out of your apartment? No. Uh, Bangalore. I need to go from Bangalore to Colombo. I don't know, but I hear Colombo has a very advanced tram system. Yes, I know. Uh, what about Madras? Absolutely. You can hire a Phaeton from Madras to Bangalore, but it's, it's expensive. <coughs> From, Mad from Bangalore, we'll see if we can go to Columbus, uh, Colombo. Uh, if not, we'll go to Madras and see if we can go to Colombo from there. 
I went to explore the restaurant car. Run by a fellow countryman who offered a menu of succulent cuts and rich soups, each with a complimentary wine. And that was where I met Anne-Marie Spencer, a girl of maybe ten years, sketching one of the waiters in his red uniform El bellboy hat. I greeted her politely, as I took the spot beside her. She smiled, and with deft movements adjusted the position of her wheeled chair to give me more room, dropping one of her pencils as she moved. I returned it with a bow, and she giggled. You must be French, she declared. You are gallant indeed. I admit I flushed, uh, smiled politely, alas, not all charming uh, Frenchmen are gallant. Uh, alas, not all charming French, uh, Frenchmen are gallant. I told her, even a rogue may have fair manners. Oh, I do not believe you are untrustworthy, monsieur, she replied with a glint in her eye. You are certainly a gentleman. I am a mere valet. A gentleman's gentleman. Well, she answered firmly, that counts twice over, does it not? I have a good eye. I see things the way they are. That's why I draw. I looked over her pictures, to be confronted by their strangeness. I could not recognize anything of the waiter she was so closely watching in the lines and shapes that filled the page. <laughs> These are truly monstrous. You have a most unusual style. You are very good. You have a most unusual style, I hedged. Oh, monsieur, I have a good eye. I can see you are lying. I shrugged and did not attempt to deny it. To deny it. <laughs> Your pictures are terrible, <laughs> mademoiselle. No, I didn't mean to say that! No, I was trying to be nice. I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes you don't know what which what these options are gonna do for you here. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Your pictures are terrible, Mademoiselle. I told her they offend my eye, my sense of proportion and space. They are unspeakable. Most honorable, she replied. I knew it. Oh. Why? I bid her farewell. And she nodded to me. I will see you again, Monsieur Passepartout, she told me as I left her. I did not stop to wonder that day how it was she knew my name. Con artist? Hmm. The next morning I discovered I had lost my passport! And with us barely an hour from arriving into Bangladore. I told Monsieur Fogg immediately, risking his displeasure at the possibility of delay, but in, think, in truth, I think he, he was amused. Should I lose my passporto? I would be most vexed. I decided to enlist the help of Anne-Marie. I hurried to the restaurant car. I called on the train guard. I wanted another chance to make things better. And her excellent eye, so I tracked her down on the observation deck to explain the situation. She looked most concerned. What might happen to you without documents? My master is well respected, so I doubt I would be imprisoned. At worst, I will not be allowed to travel. I doubt I'll be imprisoned. Well then, we shall have to look, won't we? I think you should search the crew, cha crew cabins, which my chair cannot access, and I will look about here. It seemed a good plan. So I agreed. As I was heading from the car, I felt certain the girl would locate my papers, look back and smile, thought of one more thing to ask. Looked back and smiled, and was surprised to see Anne-Marie doubled up with laughter, having not moved from her spot. What's going on? She tried to look serious, but then she began to giggle, at first delicately, then more and more uproariously. I rather feared I understood the source of her mirth. Holding out a hand, I demanded the return of my passport. By way of reply, she took my hand and got to her feet. I'm afraid I'm a dreadful kleptomaniac, she apologized with deep insincerity and dropped a curtsy. And an unparalleled liar to boot. And then she killed it again. And the chair? My arrangement with the train guard, she said. I agreed to stay in the chair and out of mischief so they wouldn't lock me up. But your pocket came so close. My passport, please. I dropped it in different shrug. Somewhere. Tell me where. I insisted firmly. Firmly. Then 
And Amory sat in again, suddenly cl Doggone it, I was trying to be flirty! You've stopped being charm uh, charming. Here's your passport. Doggone it, I was trying to be flirty with... Tell me where... Yeah, was it? Doggone it! A long and most difficult delay had been avoided and just in time as we arrived into Bangla uh, Bangalore a moment later. I'm sorry, Anne, I was trying to be nice! Alright, English poetry. Penny, black, and batva. Or I can get the English wardrobe again. Which is not a bad idea. Uh, I am in India after all. Explore. We spent most of our time in Bangalore cantonment rather than the city proper as it was administered directly by the Raj. Cantonment held the largest British garrison in South India. I was happy to pretend I was the no, largest British garrison in, in South India. And it therefore developed the churches, shops, bars, clubs, bungalow schools, gardens, and theaters required to sustain such a concentration of soldiers, mim sahibs, and children. I had a few hours to spare, so... I took a walk in Meads Park, <clears throat> where a group of off-duty cavalry officers were playing a game of cricket under the shade of peep people trees. Fancy playing with us, a young chap with a sparse, optimistic mustache look, uh, called out. Uh, I don't play cricket again, sir. I called back, and he tossed me the ball, which I caught effortlessly, fumbled a bit, I caught one-handed. Uh, I caught effortlessly, to the amusement of the other uh, cavalrymen. The ball's leather was scuffed and pitted with use. The batsman stood in front of the stumps at the other end, his face shiny with sweat. My young friend took his place as wicket keeper. Lob the ball! I lobbed it gently, I threw it hard, I bowled it over our... I threw it hard. And the arrow flew straight <coughs> as an arrow until, with a sickening crack, it struck the batsman on the shoulder! He howled with pain, and the rest of his teammates glared. Not really how it's done, dear chap, my friend said warningly. Never mind, better luck next time, eh? As I took my leave, the batsman tossed the ball back to me. Keep it, he declared, a souvenir. I thanked him and pocketed the thing, not wanting to mention my <clears throat> habit of selling our souvenirs. When I told Monsieur Fogg of my encounter and showed him my prize, his face eased into a most uncharacteristic smile. I played cricket as a child, he said. A gentleman's game. I should admit here that I had always imagined my fa uh, master to have sprung fully formed, or in fact, sprung fully formed, and complete with cravats and spats from his mother's womb. The notion of him as a child, and more so as a child who played games, well, perhaps my heart, uh, master had a heart after all. All right, um... Uh, Madras will probably have a boat to there. Okay, so that's tomorrow before 11. So let's just stay the night. <clears throat> before going to bed, I afforded my master every service. I went to stretch my legs. Um, went to stretch my legs. Took advantage of some distance from Monsieur Fogg. When I returned, both my spirits and I fancy his were much improved. Part. Address. Go. Go. <laughs> All right. We hired a phaeton from Bangalore for the long and uncomfortable drive across the middle of India to Madras, following the line of the Palar River. Okay. Reverse. Greetings, Monsieur Pardee. Can I attend to your needs, sir? Madras. Madras has changed many hands. No, I want Madras to Colombo. Absolutely. And then Colombo to... Uh, I have no idea. But Batavia? I 
because the question is where where from Colombo? The speed of our Phaeton was cruelly slow over the rough roads. After I after all, I began to wonder if a boat might be quicker. I was glad to have the canopy overhead uh, to keep the powerful uh, the power sun, powerful sunshine. The boats made their way leisurely across along beside us. It was a gentle, calm way to spend the day. As the afternoon road wore on, the ocean became visible, a clear, glittering blue cloth. Sailor's cap would sell most efficiently here. Okay. Okay, so the question is, where do you go from Colombo? Because here's Singapore, here's Batavia, here's Manila. Port Moresby, Brisbane. I'm kind of getting far away here. I want to start heading back up here, hopefully to Yokohama, and preferably to Manila. I wonder if it'll let me go to Rangoon. Rangoon, Singapore, hopefully it'll take me either all the way to Manila or to um, Yokohama. Either one of those would be, would be awesome. Let's go ahead and stay the night here. Madras was a city within a city. Inside the walls and fortifications of Fort St. George was White Town, where British men sahibs and fac factors traded and went to church and traveled from place to place in mechanical palanquins. Outside the walls were the glorified shanty. Was the glorified shanty or? found the colonial officers to be particularly dim. Uh, glorified shanty of Blacktown where Indian servants and laborers and clerks made their homes. I ventured into Blacktown where I attracted a few glances but no real attention. No doubt there were many reasons for a lone foreigner to wander the cramped streets and back alleys. But after a few minutes I realized I was being stalked. I turned to face my shadow find myself face to face with a nun <laughs> would you like a blessing good sir and an, or an ornate gold cross hung heavily from her her neck uh yes sister oh you her smile spouted razors and with no further warning she brought her heavy gold cross down on my neck with a crack the head with a crack when i awoke how much just got stolen from me My nun assailant, assailant offered me the cool cloth. I am Sister Panamalar, and this is the convent of the Sisters of Didicus. Uh, why am I here? You are here because you were meant to be here, she said portentously. My order does not believe, as the Pope does, that automatons are abominations. We believe that machines, too, are capable of grace. You believe autonomous have souls, you defy the Pope, fascinating, I replied sarcastically, all this uh, theology while my head still span. You believe autonomous have souls? Don't you? She twinkled, a most unlike expression. Building an automaton is like raising a child. They are shaped in our image as we are in God's. Those blasphemers in the Artificers Guild know nothing of God, and so their creations are godless. And you want godly machines? I asked carefully. Church on Sunday, following the commandments, all that. The, Didic, the Didician, Didac, Didacian sisters are dedicated to the search for a machine which has a soul. Now we require for your help in our search. You could have simply asked. <laughs> the Lord does not ask, he expects. Now listen to me. She helped me woozily to my feet. If you find an automaton whose shard is engraved with a soul on your travels... Send a telegram to us. We have our own receiving station here. We will reward you materially if that is your wish, but we must have such a shard. As you say, sister. Agreeing, I agreed, wishing to make good my, my escape. I'll inform you at once. I have faith, the nun said calmly. Then she let me go. I did not know what to make of Sister Pan uh, Tanam Panamalar and her order of artificer nuns then, and I do not know now. 
I admit I was rather glad to know we would be leaving Madras as its walls and, and its walls and fortifications and secrets. Well, thank goodness. Let's explore real quick. Okay, that's not gonna help. Uh, I struck a few conversations, hunting for options. Now we're out of here. And Colombo, go. Oh, airship, okay. Uh, all right, so here's the question. Where is Colombo going to take us? We're boarded a fast airship run by a British company that promised to reach Colombo within two hours. Uh, Converse. What's your wish, Passeporto? Uh, Colombo. Now a colony in Singapore. Well, if you can... You can obtain candles scented of rose in Singapore, extremely valuable in Hong Kong. Uh, Chittagong. I hear the Bengalis have their own autonomy. Okay. <clears throat> the ship was not as fast as advertised, of course, but not to any considerable degree, and they more than made up with it with some excellent tea. My master was untroubled, and my demands for compensation. Nah, they more than made up with it with some excellent tea. Give him some health there. And scones. So it was three hours, not two. We have to explore Colombo. Okay, but first, Monkey Wrench. Engineer said, if you train table, classic wallet, whiskey. Okay, none of that is interesting. That's boring. So none of that is interesting. Explore. Back to Madras. To Singapore. Okay, we're going to Singapore. The harbor at Colombo, capital city of British Ceylon, was so busy with trading ships that the water was barely visible, and the sky crisscrossed with glinting metal chains tethered, uh, tethering airships to the dock. Uh, a young Sahali, Sahalese man in a ill-fitting jacket was over the scene. Clearly, this was a here was a hub worth our finding. However, the more I look, the more I notice that several airships seem worse for wear. Their envelopes are completely patched, their ropes blackened by mold and slowly unraveling, but there was no other way on. It seemed boats had been abandoned in favor of the skies. We spent the night in a charming suite of the, in the Grand Oriental Hotel opposite the Victoria Parquet. The clattering of the electric rams ran late into the night, mixing with the low of oxygen, and I had to burn uh, mixing with the low of the oxygen. Oxygen. Oxen. Drawing the poor people's cards across the It's okay. And not Chittagong. I want Singapore. I want to adjust it. Uh with that. That's not, that's not horribly expensive. The tea clipper. We boarded a sleek tea clipper with a bright red envelope and roaring twin engines. Is your ship fast? Will be comfortable board. Is your ship fast? Asked the captain, a lean, dark-eyed Chinese man in the last flush of his youth. I go to join my wife in Singapore, the captain confessed, so you can be assured I will try to make good time. So saying, he flung the ship up into the air. Greeting, Captain. Hello. Uh, Singapore has a bad reputation, but it's a decent enough place. Okay, so let's go to Bat Batavia, and then from Batavia, ooh, what about Singapore Machu Picchu? Ooh, is there really a way to go Machu Picchu? I found myself standing beside the cheerful young captain. Are you newly married? Does your wife also sail the skies? Uh, does your wife also sail the skies? Ha! Hardly. She has just opened a Chinese bank in Singapore, although she has holdings all over Southeast Asia. She could buy me and my ship a hundred times over, in fact. She, he added with an easy, easy laugh. Uh, does her property not become yours? Brit uh, Britain only recently passed an act of parliament which allowed married women to own their own property. He looked confused. Well, I am joining her family, so that does not signify. 
I thought much on Captain Go's attitude and situation, but came to a few conclusions that night aboard the ship. Uh, go ahead and work on him. He's, this, this is going to be a long trip. It's probably going to beat him up a little bit. There were rumblings of discontent aboard the ship, centered upon the figure of First Mate Ren, Renuga, a dark-skinned, towering Sihalese woman. I inquired double, subtly into her grudge over lunch. <clears throat> this is our last voyage, she replied darkly. The captain's selling the ship and joining his wife's business. But he seems so, he seems to be happily. What will you do then? Her shoulders slumped. Me and the crew are stuck. This ship has been our home. Uh, we stared at our unappetizing stews. Why don't you buy the ship? Uh, first mate Ren Renuga's uh, expression turned even blacker. Oh, I tried, but the price is too high, even if we all go in together. How much? 27,000 pounds, he, she replied crisply. That's how profitable selling tea is, it seems. Do you want to help? We may be able to help. Thinking that a purchase of an airship would be no bad thing. Ha! As though you could help us, she replied sourly. A funny idea, but we have some funny ideas of our own, she added darkly. She grimaced into her, her suit. Just wait and see. Oh! They're not going to mute me, are they? Greetings, first mate. Yes, what do you want? Uh, okay. Singapore with the boat route to Matava. Machu Picchu? No. Um, I don't want to go to Port Mosby or Stone Town. What is Antananarivo? I don't know what that is. I want to go north, because I want to go to Yokohama. Oh, boy. The first sign of trouble was when the lights began to flicker. The gas lamp sputtered out just before the secondary engine cut out, leaving the airship in darkness and silence. I groped my way to the bridge to investigate the matter. Raised voices echoed from behind the oak-paneled door, speaking in English. Uh, I stopped to listen. Nahinsa, I, I heard Captain Go's voice say pleadingly. How can you do this? I couldn't hear the reply, and so pushed the door open a small crack and peered in. First mate Renuga was holding a pistol to Captain Go's head while the crew looked on in shamefaced but determined mutiny. There were tears on the first mate's face as she said, You did this, Captain. You abandoned us. I kept listening as Go protested, but Renuga cut him off. To one of the crew, she continued, Go and fetch the passengers. Glad as fast as I could, felt my way slowly back. I stepped to one side of the door, hoping to stay hidden in the dark. It succeeded, but of course my master did not, and was soon dragged past me onto the bridge. I stayed hidden, hoping to find a good moment to strike, but then the situation changed abruptly. Something seemed to break in Captain Go's expression. He, he leapt upon the first mate with sudden startling ferocity, and they began to grapple for the pistol. I tried to stop uh, uh, first mate Renuga. The pistol jerked, and the bullet punched a hole through the outer hull above us. I heard a shrill whistle of air before we were knocked to the floor by the sound of an almighty explosion! I looked up! And half the top deck was sheared away and swinging free, and the entire envelope had ignited in a glowing, writhing ball of fire! Ah! Wind went past us! We rolled and tumbled in the air! We were falling uncontrollably! Did we just die? 